Well, now I'm starting to think The Watcher is just based on a Thompson Twins song. Uh, but yes, today we will be talking about The Watcher, a bit of a hit on Netflix right now, uh, based loosely, I would argue, uh, on a real-life story and a real-life magazine article. Uh, we'll also be talking a little bit later about Bros, uh, which is a brand new rom-com from the mind, mostly, I think, of Billy Eichner, he of Billy on the Street. So all of that's coming up, and we'll do some recommendations as well. Uh, and when I say we, who do I mean? I mean the nose, and the nose today consists of Rebecca Castellani, co-founder of Quiet Corner Communications and a freelance writer, Jacques Lamar, playwright and chief communications officer at Buzz Engine, and Tracy Wu Fastenberg, development officer at Connecticut Children's. So yes, we are going to begin with The Watcher, and before our panel gets going... Uh, let's uh, hear a little clip from the movie. Let me just kind of set this up a tiny bit. I think what's happening here in the second episode is, so I guess I have to state the premise, which is that this family of four decides um, to leave New York City and move to kind of a dream house in the suburbs. But when they get to the dream house, it kind of seems like maybe they're not alone. And then it kind of seems like maybe there's like somebody really, really bad doing stuff. They're getting letters from a person who calls him or herself the Watcher. Uh, and so three of the four um, remove themselves to a local motel. Uh, Bobby Cannavale, who plays the husband, Dean, uh, is uh, back at the house most of the time. Naomi Watts and her kids. Uh, she plays Nora or at the hotel. OK, that's all you need to know. Here's... Dean and Nora. You okay? Uh, What yeah. is it? What? You know how I was saying we should sell? Hmm? It's like all this time I felt the terror. And I don't think I've actually acknowledged how angry I am. Angry at me? at whoever's doing this to us. We moved out here to be inoculated from this kind of fear, right? And I know it's not happening just to us, it's happening to everyone all across the country. Your life can just be destroyed. You're targeted. We're not really safe anywhere. Is that what we should be telling our kids? That if somebody terrorizes us, we just let them, we just run? I don't know how we keep doing this, but... I don't think we can give up yet. You... are a fighter, baby. And you always have been. All right. That's right, you are a fighter, baby. Uh, all right, so... <laughs> I just have to confess something about about this, which is I watched like three or four episodes of this, and I was completely hooked. I didn't want to go to bed. I wanted to just like to stay up and, and watch it. I, I did not, in fact, follow that particular instinct. I had different thoughts about it towards the end, but I just needed to get that off my chest. The panel has their own thoughts. And Rebecca Castellani, maybe you can get us going on all this. It does feel like there's the – the, the elements, I think you pointed this out as we were emailing, the elements seem to be there for a delicious meal uh, with uh, Bobby and, and Naomi and their kids and all the crazy stuff that's going on. But it is a largely unsatisfying lunch. Yeah, I like you, Colin, watched the first couple episodes and I was on board. I mean, this is like my target Netflix or demographic show. It's a based on a true story. The source material is so juicy. I remember being absolutely captivated by this when the original uh, 
New York Mag article about it came out in 2018. I was on Reddit. I was like looking up Google Maps of this house. I was one of these crazy people. <laughs> so I'm like, when this came along, Ryan Murphy's at the helm. You've got Mia Farrow and Jennifer Coolidge and the supporting cast. I was like, everything's here. This is going to be great. The vibe was right. It was giving me this sort of like 2022 take on Stepford. It was just seemingly on paper. And for the first two episodes, pretty great. And then the cracks started appearing and it all sort of came undone. And by the end, I don't know if a show has made me as angry as this one did all year. I mean, it has absolutely just incensed me. Um, I don't really have an explanation for what went so wrong other than like Ryan Murphy just like did too much, which he, you know, he has done before. He's, he does one thing, he does too much. But it was it was hard. It was hard to get through at the end. The writing got completely off the rails. The acting choices were questionable. I mean, it was just a lot went wrong very quickly. Yeah, I should say that Mia Farrow plays this kind of spooky person who's I mean, everybody in the neighborhood's kind of spooky. Margot Martindale and Richard Kind are one set of neighbors. Richard Kind is really wasted too. He has like four lines yeah. or something, you know. But uh Yes, but meanwhile, she's living uh, across the street. And, and she basically, it's like sort of like if Wyeth's Helga moved in across the street. She looks exactly like those Helga paintings by Wyeth right down to the pigtails. So, uh, Tracy Wu Fastenberg, uh, how about you? Are you any happier with this? Uh, no, and I got, I got much unhappier much sooner than Rebecca. Um, I think I was probably about five minutes in and texted Jacques and was like, I, I can't. But I'd watched all of them. So it did its job. It's got, it got my views on Netflix or whatever. Um, but it was, it was painful yet kind of like a train wreck. You can't not watch, um, like Rebecca captivated by the real story. Cause I mean, it is, it's a creepy true life story, but number one, they messed with it a whole lot. And number two, they took like a left-hand turn that, you know, it, it ceased to be as nearly as intriguing as the real story. And they had such good source material. Yeah. Um, I actually, I love Jennifer Coolidge. I had a hard time separating her from her comedic roles. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while to like really get into her character, but she was, she was great. She was, you know, vicious and hateful and all of those <laughs> wonderful things. Um, I like Naomi Watts. I like a lot of the actors here. I like the source material. I could not. I want some of that time back. Although, um, you know, can I just go back to one thing about about Jennifer Coolidge? Because I think it's an interesting question that pervades this particular work, which is because, in fact, at a certain point, you start to wonder if Dean and Nora are reliable narrators and to what degree, since, in fact, they lead us and we get led down such a long series of blind alleys, you know, you start to wonder maybe so much of what we're seeing is kind of their interpretation uh, of of how evil and rotten and horrible people like Jennifer Coolidge's character. I mean, I guess there's sort of plot-driven elements that would suggest uh, a certain amount of cynicism uh, in that character. But I wonder if she's, if, if we're meant to believe that she's entirely as horrible as they wind up thinking she is. But at the same time, they're not portrayed. Okay, so maybe Naomi is a little vanilla kind of victim-y, but Bobby's kind of a jerk. Yeah. Like he's, you know, he overreacts every two oh seconds. Oh my God. The yelling all the time. So I feel like to me, it, it didn't feel that way because I disliked him so much. Mm -hmm. um, if I had liked him better, I might be more convinced that it was really their sort of twisted point of view. But he, um, I really didn't like him either. All right. So fortunately, Jacques just loved this thing. So we'll have some <laughs> kind of balance here, right? I truly hated this show. <laughs> Uh, and it, it, it was fairly instantaneous and I, you know, I had not paid attention to it. Um, it, it immediately, uh, had the, as soon as Ryan Murphy's name came up on the screen, I knew it was going to be bad. Um, <laughs> I truly think that he's the worst thing to happen to television since, uh, Copland maybe. Um, but I, you know, he gets these amazing casts. And so I had hope. I love Bobby Cannavale. I love um, Jennifer Coolidge, Margot Martindale, Mia Farrow. And so, you know, no one gets to a point where they even achieve like half a dimension beyond one dimension, uh, a char you know, character-wise. Um, as it 
the final episode, which I know lost you, Colin, I actually thought was the best episode because at that point it transcended into camp. Finally. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't like so, so bad. It was great for me. Um, you know, it didn't achieve like mommy dearest levels until <laughs> the end when it was completely off the rail. Um, I don't know the actress's name, but I want to give all the uh, all the Oscars, Emmys, and Tony awards to the woman who played the inexplicable detect uh, uh, private eye. She's uh, great. She yes. was in The Undoing as well. She's fabulous. Oh, uh, she was fantastic, and uh, she. Um, I mean, her character made absolutely no sense. Um, <laughs> You know, what lounge singer doesn't become a private detective after they watch some uh, true crime television while being in the cancer ward or no, in rehab. Uh, but she has a lot going on, as, as do um, except for the neighbors who have nothing going on in their lives. She had a lot going on in her, li- in her life. But I mean, it was just like one red herring after the next. It did not need to be seven episodes in length. Mm-hmm. Um Everyone gets their chance to be a potential uh, uh, suspect um, to the point where you don't care who it is anymore. (laughs) Uh, It's the least mysterious mystery. Uh, And I didn't know the original story. And I, I, like Rebecca, am all about true crime. Um, I love a good true crime documentary. And this was... uh, Terrible. <laughs> By the way, I believe the name you're searching for is, I don't know how to say this name, Norma Dumezweni. Yes. Uh, and so she's the person who plays this rather unusual choice for a private investigator, as, you, as you're suggesting. Um, <laughs> but um, so, Rebecca, and I think maybe without spoilers and also maybe without less sort of they, one thing says A, the other thing says B, you have, I think, the best grasp of the source material of all of us. And, and maybe you could just say a little bit about that kind of divergence. I mean, it seems as though Murphy made choices he didn't have to make. It wasn't that the yeah. original source material wasn't good enough and he <laughs> had to tart it up. No, the original source material has got more twists and turns, arguably, than the show did. And so when they started introducing some of the more like supernatural elements, and again, I'm not going to get into spoil- spoiler territory, but there's a lot left unresolved that Brian Murphy brought into the story that was just so unnecessary and takes away from the actual facts. So of the things that actually happen, it's some of the more unbelievable things. Like they do have neighbors that just pull up lawn chairs and are watching them from their lawn. They do have this crazy brother sister dynamic living in the next door neighbor house where the son wanders onto people's property. They do have a random boy whose screen name happens to be the watcher. I mean, there's just layers and layers of twists and turns. A high school class had an assignment, that whole subplot where it was like they had to write letters to houses that they admired and was that this gone wrong like all of these crazy little things actually happen in the real life story and I feel like if they had just played this a little bit more straight and a little truer to the source text this could have been phenomenal and to Jacques point it was way too long and I think that this is just another example of unfortunately like our streaming culture where Netflix wants to put out the next big thing that everyone's going to binge watch which is what's happening I think it's number one or two on Netflix and has been for at least a week But if it had been like a 90 minute thriller directed by somebody that could have brought, you know, less camp and made it more serious, I think it could have been fantastic. Or if Ryan Murphy had gone full American Horror Story and done like American Horror Story, The Watcher, it could have been great. Like if it was like chewing the scenery, ridiculous, bombastic all the way, like I could have been down for that. But I would have preferred like a much straighter telling of this bonker story. And I highly, highly recommend if you're not familiar with it. Google it. Uh, all you have to type is in the watcher of the cut and it will come right up. It's a long read, but it is one of the most suspenseful reads. It's better than like an Agatha Christie novel. It is unbelievable. You got to check it out if you've not read it. It's really amazing. Yeah. And there are enough things that are not like not resolved in the real story yes. that they didn't need to have like a colander of a, a plot line here where there's so many plot holes and so many like unwrapped up things where like, oh, you think it's going to go this way, but they don't even wrap it up. It's just, you know, for the heck of it. Yeah. So, so by the way, we are, had- we're going we're gonna to link to, we'll link to the story in the show post. So if you go to ctpublic.org, I think 
slash Colin. I don't know how you find the show. But if you can find our show page, uh, we'll put it up on social media and stuff like that, too. Jacques, what were you about to say? Uh, a, if you want to hate watch this show, you should watch it and then read um, Vulture's episode recaps where they they point out every plot inconsistency. Oh and boy. it's hilarious. And the reason I was like having to look up episode recaps is like in the final episode, they just casually mention this one character has died. <laughs> and I was like, did I miss something? <laughs> and I had to go back and rewatch the end of episode six. And then I was like, no. And then I had to go back and re re and it was just literally, they're just like, Oh, he died. Sorry. Spoiler. It's a male. And <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about, and I'm watching it because it has nothing really to do with the actual plot either. Oh no! Mercy. Let's just say it's one half of couple that we've already oh. been led to believe is dead. <laughs> it is suddenly dead again. Yeah, I missed that. Unbelievable. Yeah, and then you're like, well, I can't even trust that they're really dead because this <laughs> show will just pull stuff out of its butt so fast. <laughs> and then there's like the evil. Uh historical society the subplot. HOA that's yeah. the best subplot <laughs> the HOA who are ferociously protecting dumb waiters it, oh <laughs> why am i even Google dumb waiters contemplating the show you watch it. <laughs> all right so i i would like you to indulge me and shift off the subject of this show partly. I mean, one of the problems with this show, I think, also is there's no character who's really an on-ramp for us. Usually you need somebody whose responses to the situation are similar to one's own, you know, somebody that you sort of identify with. Most of the peop- most of the possibilities are just not there. Um, I mean, like, even in White Lotus, where everybody's just horrible, <laughs> there's, there's at least the kid who goes canoeing, whatever his name is. You know? <laughs> you know, he's like the only person that you can even remotely stand in White Lotus. <laughs> and and but there isn't even that. But if there's anybody, it's probably the Naomi Watts character. Bobby's character is just out of control, as everybody's saying. But I mean, you know, most people when you move into a new neighborhood and there's a, like a little problem that comes up, you you say, "Well, come on in, let's have a glass of wine, we'll talk about it." <laughs> Bobby just like <laughs> screams at people immediately. So, but Naomi Watts's character Nora is probably uh. the closest thing to somebody we can identify with. Rebecca and I realized watching this that I have a complicated relationship with Naomi. <laughs> Watts in the sense that to me she has she's this sort of person with no real fixed identity to me and so that could mean she's a great actor because she could just disappear into any role I realize there's a lot of things that I've watched Naomi Watts in that I don't remember <laughs> that it was her you know I remember the character but I don't remember it's her but the other possibility is that kind of like the outfits she wears she kind of is you know, I don't know. She's just sort of like a piece of white cloth that you can project all kinds of things on. Like, is she a ghost? Or like, she, I really yeah. reached a point midway through this. I'm like, is this going to really go off the rails? And it's just like Naomi Watts is a ghost. That's why she wears monochromatic, like beige fits all the time. Like, I don't know. And that I don't have the answers. Um, but I agree with you that I cannot name a single role Naomi Watts has ever been in. Um, I always, in my mind, get her mixed up with Nicole Kidman, but Nicole Kidman is the superior actress. Um, so sorry, Naomi Watts. I but, have no but shade like, to your cinematographic. Like, again. woo, I think you are a no- Naomi Watts fan. So, I mean, I, I really, I'm agnostic about this. I literally <laughs> don't know whether she's a good actor or not. All I know is that I have a hard time latching on to her. See, I like her because she is sort of, you know, understated in a lot of her roles. You know, if you think back to, I don't know, what is it, late 90s, early 2000s with Mulholland Drive and The Ring and oh. things like that. You know, like that's where. Oh, the Ring. Yeah, yeah, she was from The Ring. <laughs> and that's sort of. <laughs> Well, there's certainly one scene. Oh, one, there's one scene in Mulholland Drive that we will we'll never forget. Uh, yeah. But uh, but I had actually forgotten that was Naomi Watts. Yes, that was. Her, but that's the thing is, you know, she was nominated for a lot of awards right around that time period, and she was in some decent roles. Now, I will say, the past I don't know, twenty years, not really sure what she's been in, but she looks fantastic, and she did. You know, she very much herself blended into her wardrobe, and I still don't understand the point of that. Um, but I think I I do like her. Um, and I just didn't love her in this because I didn't really love the entirety of it. Right. I mean, and just imagine if, you know, cause I thought, you know, in, in one of the 957 red herrings in this thing, 
that there's one moment where it's very Rosemary's baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you think about Mia Farrow in that part, not the part that she plays in this, but the part where she's the person that you're, kind, you know, rooting for and in a way or get, or being afraid through her eyes and whatnot, you know, how a, a truly effective actor in that part. I mean, poor Naomi Watts. She was hampered with such a terrible script, but, uh, you know, it, it's like, it, I kind of feel like she was, I mean, literally like everything that she's in is like cream and oatmeal. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and so, and fortunately, most of all the backgrounds are white, so she fades into them anyway. But, you know, with someone who can kind of communicate terror like Mia Farrow, you know, that would have been the best thing that Mia Farrow does in this is give us a chicken casserole recipe that you can use. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, she spells the whole thing out, too. I, I do want to say one thing about that. It's a really fascinating uh, comparison you're making. One thing that I would say that is maybe a big difference, and it may be a di- big difference in time periods and social mores and stuff like that. For me, Rosemary's Baby is in large part about social tension because there's something that is not being said, you know, Oh, and as as Mia Farrow's as Rosemary's awareness of this grows, you realize there's something really awkward about having to say to family members and neighbors and whoever the hell else all those people are. Wait a minute, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you usually start dreading that. You know, the the moment that ice has to break, you start dreading that as much as you dread anything else. And Jacques, to me, that's what's kind of opposite, absent in The Watcher, which is like everybody just starts screaming at everybody else, or at least, you know, Dean and Nora just start <laughs> accusing everybody within only 10 minutes of anything going wrong. You know, so that you, there is no social tension building up. The tension that's building up is really kind of almost with their nuclear family. Yeah, and, you know, I... I kept yelling at my TV, why don't they put in sprinklers and get a guard dog? Because everyone comes and camps out on their lawn. (laughs) Or their actual house. (laughs) Yeah, it's just absolutely, uh, you know, But they do that in the real life version. Like at one point, this guy tries to get military personnel. He like puts out some ad being like, come work out in my backyard. And like, I'm going to have a big dog there. Like I'm telling you, the real life story is so much crazier. uh, They could have. They could have so could much have left that. on the cutting room floor that right. should have been in there. In and general, yet, we got me a thorough pigtails. Pets do not have good experiences in the Ryan Murphy version of this story. No. So maybe we don't want to get them another dog. Um, all right. So I, I think we've all made our feelings clear here. <laughs> and yet, it, yeah, it is, I think we're really ambivalent about it. Right. I mean, the odd thing is, of course, we're living in Ryan Murphy's world right now, especially on Netflix. He's got this and he's got Dahmer. I mean, if you really wanted to go camp, Jacques, you could have merged them at the end, you know, like you <laughs> open the door, the, you know, or, would have been perfect. open the door to the tunnel and there's Jeff eating a, cas- oh. eating a casserole made out of Mia, Mia Farrow or something. But, missed uh, opportunity. Missed and opportunity. the thing is, I wanted to watch Dahmer, like Niecy Nash looks amazing in those trailers and whatnot. And then I saw that it was Ryan Murphy. I'm like, nope. <laughs> Ryan Murphy spoils. I have been tricked too many times by that individual. <laughs> Ryan Murphy spoils everything, even our fun with cannibalism. All right, so yes. we have to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about bros. Next caller. Whatever happened to that movie you wrote? Oh yeah, the movie. These big movie producers came to me and said, we want you to write a rom-com about a gay couple. Something the whole world would enjoy. Something that a straight guy might even like and watch with his girlfriend. I said, something a straight guy might like? Like what exactly? Am I gonna be in the middle of some high-speed chase and then all of a sudden fall in love with Ice Cube? Am I gonna get butt by Jason Momoa while we're both, I don't know, worrying about a volcano? And he said, Bobby, We just want to make a movie that shows the world gay and straight relationships are the same. Love is love is love. I said, love is love is love. No, it's not. That's bull****. That is a lie we had to make up to convince you idiots to finally treat us fairly. Love is not love. Our relationships are different. Our sex lives are different. And he said, Bobby, 
we were just trying to make a nice movie about nice gay people. And I said, well, there's your first mistake because not all gay people are nice. And I got up and left. Anyway, it's totally fine. I'm not the right person to write a rom-com anyway. All right, that is the voice of Billy Eichner uh, playing Bobby uh, in uh, one of the two romantic leads uh, in Bros, his new movie. Um, he has the host of a podcast, which as far as I can tell, only has like a new episode at once every three months or something. I don't know. It's hard to see how that's going to work. But um, but he's also kind of laying down some of the premise and some of the – uh, some of the tensions maybe uh, uh, in this particular movie. Uh, so once again, the nose uh, is Rebecca Castellani, Jacques Lamar, Tracy Wu Fastenberg. Tracy Wu Fastenberg, why don't you get, get us going on this? Um, this is, you know, in, so, in some ways it doesn't totally break new ground, but this is maybe as much Hollywood money as, there, as has been poured into a gay romantic comedy that I can think of anyway. So in a way, it's carrying not only its own weight, but maybe the weight of a, a lot of other things coming down the pipeline. So I think I shared that, you know, romantic comedies are not my thing. Um, actually, we were going through a list of like the top romantic comedies over time. And I realized that I either disliked or had never seen most of them um, because a lot of them are very formulaic. You know, you kind of know what's going to happen. And I think this this followed that, you know, I, I think what it meant to be was a romantic comedy with two gay characters as the main gay character as the main characters. And I think that it succeeded in that. Um, it was funnier than I expected it to be. Um, I liked that it was somewhat self-aware and that, you know, it was entertaining. It was much better than I expected it to be. Um, but generally romantic comedies are not what I'm going to go for. Um, I know that, you know, people view some of the actors differently and they expected it to be funnier or less funny or, um, you know, more luxury or something along those lines. I feel like it actually, for me, struck a nice balance of, you know, being funny, being somewhat smart. Um, I mean, it did kind of go in a lot of different directions at different times. Um, but I enjoyed it more than I thought I would, but given the genre is not my thing, maybe that was a low bar, mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad it was made. I feel like they did a good job of representing a lot of different communities within it um, in a way that was, that seemed not glorifying um, and, and not sugarcoating as well, um, but it was still funny. I should say that it is uh, written by, by Billy Eichner and Nicholas Stoller. Nicholas Stoller uh, directed he of Forgetting uh, Sarah Marshall uh, and Get Him to the Greek and other movies as well. Um, and it, it has not done probably as well as it really needed to do uh, at the box office. I mean, the rest of that story has yet to be written, but it, it, I think the expectations accompanied accompanying the movie, and we should say it was sort of produced by Judd Apatow and two other people, and that may have helped propel it a little bit. Um, it, it's sort of not doing, I think, what people hoped it would do at the box office. But Jacques, what were your thoughts about this? Um, well, I was, uh, you know, I I held off on getting super excited about it, um, but then the reviews hit and they were very good. Mm. Um, I think it was like over 90% on, on Rotten Tomatoes, at least it was it at one point, not that it's necessarily like I've got that it needs that imprimatur for me to go. Um, but I thought I've got to go see this before I'm told I'm not allowed to enjoy it. So um, so I went the first night and I really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, on a number of different levels, uh, you know, as we were uh, emailing back and forth before the show, uh, I was never a fan of Billy on the Street. Um, I know that that we do have some Billy on the Street fans here. Um, so I found, you know, that persona to be very annoying. There's another show that I know that he's on that people really like him on, but I can't remember what it's called. I'm sure you. He was on Parks and Rec. He had Parks a role on Parks and Rec. Yeah. Uh, no, right. but there was another one. I want to say it begins with a D. Um, but uh, I, I can see Rebecca's Googling furiously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but. Um, you know, he's he's a little bit of a hard pill to swallow as a romantic lead because he's um, has a certain kind of unlikable energy. Um, you know, we don't think of people oftentimes who are so political uh, and this character is very political in a way um, as being romantic lead material. Um, he can't get out of his own way in terms of his kind of 
activism on behalf of the LGBTQ community. Difficult people. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, but, um, you know, I think there's, uh, to, to Tracy's point, there's something really kind of fun and subversive about this film that is embracing the tropes of a romantic comedy um, and also subverting them. Um, it's wildly sexual for a romantic comedy um, as the gay community can be wildly sexual. Um, it, you know, it tries to, uh, overlay, you know, a larger conversation about the LGBTQ community, even though it's focused on a gay male couple. Uh, and I like, I think there is also something interesting at play that, um, most of the straight parts in the film are played by gay actors. And I didn't know that going in. And I thought, um, as a member of community of a community who oftentimes will go see a Hollywood big budget film about gay characters, they are oftentimes played by straight characters who receive awards for playing gay. And the movie makes fun of that too, with a when the two gay men go on a date to see a broke back mountain power of the dog kind <laughs> of film. Um, so I think there's and there, you know, there's some Woody Allen vibe going on as well in the movie, which I I uh, have talked about my Woody Allen fandom. Um, so, I mean, there's there's a lot that I really like, but I think overall, it it was a funny film, and and I I did care about the outcome, even though. If I were Luke McFarlane, I would have run in a different direction. <laughs> All right. Speaking of Luke McFarlane, he's the other uh, romantic lead. I didn't really know too much about him. I guess he was in like actual a lot of like Hallmark type of like, pictures and stuff like that uh, in real life, which is kind of interesting because there's a lot of evocation of that also uh, in yeah. this movie. So although I think it's called Hallheart or something. I don't know why. They, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why do they feel like they had to change the name? I have no idea. But anyway, um, here because Luke. McFarlane was in the film. Yeah, but. that could be. So uh, here are the two romantic leads, Billy Eichner, Luke McFarlane, as Bobby and Aaron, uh, and here they are discussing their favorite movie of all time. What's your favorite movie of all time? What's my favorite movie of all time? I don't know. Why? What's your favorite movie? The Hangover. The Hangover is your favorite movie of all time? How many movies have you seen? One? It's a funny movie. Yeah, kinda. And you remember one of the first lines of that movie? Paging Dr. Faggot. Remember that? Yes. Paging Dr. Faggot is one of the first lines of the highest grossing comedy of 2009. And no one talks about it, right? And it wasn't that long ago. You know, we're just supposed to like laugh it off. It doesn't bother me. I'm not sensitive like that. I think you just like getting angry at things. Getting angry at things is like your brand. What? No, it's not. You getting angry at things is my brand. No, 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 no. You just don't like to complain about it because that means your feelings were hurt, and that means admitting you're weak, and that's too vulnerable. And as much as we go around saying men should be vulnerable, you and I both know that is such bull. Because for a lot of these gay guys, sweetness and vulnerability are wonderful and lovely, but they can also be a real boner killer. You're very intense. Yes. You know, Rebecca. Listening to that, I like this movie better than when I when I watched it. Uh, you and I both had a, a little. We should both say that we are both big fans of Billy on the Street. And for people who don't know this, this is a, a series that that Eichner started in two thousand one. It features a very very amped up version of him running around New York with a microphone, often accompanied by a celebrity, often asking just people on the street to either answer questions. Uh, or engage with the celebrity. And, and there was one where he just claimed that Tina Fey has no friends outside of uh, show business and dragged her all over over New York, introducing her to people and demanding to know if they would be her friend, sometimes thrusting a dollar bill in the face of somebody and asking them a question with such energy that they're just their minds just melt down right in front of you. The most famous one, I think, is he goes up to a woman in the streets of New York and just goes, for a dollar, name a woman. And, and this woman can't do it. <laughs> she literally cannot name a woman just because he's just he's there in such, such such a big way in front of her. So I don't know, Rebecca, maybe the fact that we both like Billy on the street has something to do with why this movie didn't make us laugh as much as we wanted to. To the clips being played back, I'm laughing a lot more yeah. than when I was watching it. 
And I had the same experience with the trailer. I watched the trailer and I was like, this is great. I'm so excited. I have been to one movie in the movie theater since the pandemic started, but I went out on a date night expressly to see this, saw it, was really excited and was like kind of let down by it. I felt that it wasn't as funny as I was expecting, given how much Billy on the Street makes me laugh. And more, I think, egregiously for me was that I had a really, really hard time buying the romance and buying their chemistry. I thought that Billy Eichner was just like doing his classic abrasion, but without any of that sort of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge that you get with Billy on the street, which is subtle. I mean, he is so intense, but he does like know when to pull back a little bit on that show and certainly did so on Parks and Rec. I can't speak to difficult people, but Craig was fantastic on Parks and Rec for that reason. And I just found that in bros, Bobby just wasn't getting my sympathy. And like Jacques, I was like, if I was Aaron, I would run a mile from this man. Like he is absolutely unhinged. And there is, it was just like a a lot of criticism all the time without any of that, like catharsis that cracks his heart, you know, and, and you do get the romantic like payoff, but I just didn't buy it. And I think that that really took me out of it. And, and because I didn't find the comedy as, impressive as I was hoping it was going to be. I just kind of was like, where's the ROM? Where's the com? I, it was not a bad movie. I didn't say like, I, you know, I wish I hadn't spent money seeing this in the theaters and compared to the watcher, like having just, you know, finished that and gone through all my processing of grief, anger, and despair, it seems better comparatively speaking. So certainly not as bad as that by any means, but another instance where I've kind of like, you know, all the ingredients are there and this could have been great. And I just felt like it needed a little more finessing and perhaps like a little softer touch in terms of like the chemistry and the romance. Shock, I I find myself wondering whether he's trying to do too many different things. You know, I mean, he's trying to do a rom-com. He's trying to get it at times as zany as an early Woody Allen movie. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a scene where one of the characters that there's sort of this kind of almost fantasy phone call to his parents to announce that he's part of a thruple. (laughs) The parents get very excited. Oh, he's part of a thruple. And it is there's a lot of things that are funny. Then there's some things that are serious. There's some things that are very thoughtful. There's an LGBTQ plus museum, you know, and there's a there's kind of some interesting conversations going on, not dissimilar from what we just heard heard on the about the hangover about, well, what's really going on here? What gets celebrated? What doesn't get celebrated? You know, I I felt uh, I don't know. I, I I would hate to say pick a lane because I don't think movies have to pick a lane. But this thing feels mm. to me like it's on in six or seven lanes, and and I wonder if that maybe is a problem for it. N- not a problem that you experienced, obviously. Yeah, I mean it moves at a pace. Mm-hmm. It only really slows down at this one scene where Billy Eichner is talking on the beach to Luke McFarlane. And that was the moment I opted to go back, go to the bathroom. And I came back (laughs) and there were like five plot points that I missed because it moved that fast. I'm like, he's a chocolatier all of a sudden. What happened? (laughs) And, um, you know, I mean, to me, the things that are most successful are, you know, it or, and some of the funniest are the things that are observations about and, and skewering gay culture. Um, I love that it's a deeply gay film, a deeply, you know, LGBTQ film. I'm sure that uh, other segments of the community may not feel as as represented and what have you. But um, I think that he tried. And I think that, um, you know, the stuff surrounding the museums, you know, uh, you know, cruising culture, um, you know, how how uh, we're supposed to be so. sex positive and what have you but you know like billy struggles with the fact that you know that there's an open relationship on you know potentially on the table or that they want to be in a three-way or a four-way with a fourth who's not really welcome and you know there there's a lot about gay culture in this film that's really really funny and not sanctimonious and kind of takes the air out of her tires which i i like I think some of it does come at the expense of of the romance part of it. Um, and I think it's also wanting to to spoof romantic comedy, and like some of the funniest things are the are the jokes at the expense of Hallmark films, <laughs> like a Holly Polly Christmas and stuff like that. It, <laughs> I was in tears, and so I, you know, there's a lot of spaghetti being thrown at the wall. Um, not everything sticks, but I think. Um, 
you know, when was the last time you saw a truly smart romantic comedy, regardless of whether or not it was a, a, a gay romantic comedy. And it's been a while, I think. Um, and I think the fact, you know, for, for the LGBTQ community, um, oftentimes, you know, we're just not represented on screen um, in a big way. You know, I, I work without film Connecticut and, they present, you know, literally a hundred different films every year, short, short length. And, and, but they're all, you know, indie, you know, very hard to find movies. This was something that was not hard to find. And to have someone like Judd Apatow behind it, you know, uh, I was like, take my money, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, no. Um, I think that the, speaking of, you know, kind of intelligent rom-coms, the movie that it resembles the most is, is Trainwreck. I mean, it, uh, it has some of the same qualities. Schumer's character is similar in certain ways to Eichner's character. Mm-hmm. And, and there's sort of ways in which that works. And, you know, we're going to run out of time here. But, Tracy, it is also true that there's some kind of interesting little cameos here and there. and People kind of either playing themselves or playing really funny things. There is this whole Provincetown episode, which they just kind of almost generically do Provincetown. I don't think they really <laughs> do much with it, but um, but there's this. They they go Tracy for financing to this guy uh, whose last name is Grape, uh, and he's played by Bo and Yang. And to me, at that moment, I thought, oh well, that's sort of that's the kind of Billy Eichner manic energy that I'm used to. I thought Bo and Yang really made a very good use of his four and a half minutes of screen time or whatever he's got. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I love Bo and Yang. I follow him on Instagram. And I actually, in there are times on SNL, I'm sort of like, ah, uh, you know, you're kind of, they didn't do you justice. But I really, I cracked up at his portions there. And even, you know, later on when he's shown on a, on a screen, you know, as part of something at the museum, like he, I don't know, he just tickles me like, you know, and tickles my sense of humor in, in just the right way. Um, and I enjoyed that. I do take issue with the fact that they kept on calling it Provincetown. Because for some reason, I'm just used to be call it, it being called P-Town. So, you know, and they didn't call it that once. They just kept on yeah. calling it it's Provincetown. The people who, uh, people who, but, they're showing this movie in Indiana, too. They may not know what P-Town is. <laughs> All right. We have to take a break here. Uh, the movie is Bros. Uh, and uh, you've heard our opinions about it. Uh, make your own decisions. And we will come back. We'll make some other endorsements. We met at the club. Right, carry remix on. All the boys in harnesses, you didn't recognize the song. You took me up, up to Provincetown, where for years the deviant boys have run around. All right, so uh, great to have Kat Pastor back as technical producer. Kat was under the weather for a while, and if we get her permission, we're going to publish the list of really, really terrible television that she watched while she was. It really is. You shouldn't even stare directly into it. Use like a piece of smoked glass when you look at this list. Uh, and obviously, Jonathan McPants is the producer of The Nose and of this episode and all that stuff. So now some endorsements. Jacques Lamar, why don't you get us going? Um, I'm going to endorse a, uh, I think it's a relatively new, just little breakfast and lunch place in downtown Manchester called Penny's. Um, it's only got like four or five tables and a counter. Um, mom is back in the kitchen. They have, and this is the sign of quality, humongous desserts. Um, but you know, they also have, it's, it's for a tiny place. It's got a really very interesting menu. So downtown Manchester, I think it's open seven days a week, but definitely breakfast and lunch. Well worth your time. I had the carrot cake today. It was delicious. Um, And then just a quick plug, if I may, I have a short comedy called the scratch game. It's kind of a, a a, uh, play on uh, the dating game. That's going to be at the Hartford fringe festival. If people haven't been to the Hartford fringe festival yet, there are two days left to it. Um, and my play tomorrow is at one o'clock and seven o'clock. It's only 30 minutes. Tickets are $13 and proceeds benefit Kenway's cause and Southington animal rescue. Oh, well, that's lovely. All right. Thanks so much for that. Uh, and uh, Rebecca Castellani, what have you got for us today? 
Okay, so in our pre-emails, you'd send us a list of some of the biggest box office flops, of which Bros is apparently one of them. And one of the films on the list is something I've been meaning to see for a very long time, but it just has never been on the streaming platform I'm subscribed to at the right time. And that is Children of Men, uh, the pivotal, I believe it was 2006 science fiction movie starring Clive Owen. And I watched it last night and it was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. So if you, like me, have been had that on your list for a long time, it is on Hulu right now. And my second one is one of the Booker Prize shortlists. Um, it's a very, very small book called, appropriately, Small Things Like These. It's by an Irish writer, Claire Keegan. Uh, again, super short. I think it's like less than 100 pages. It's kind of got like this Dickensian Christmas carol bent loosely about a coal monger and the Magdalene laundries in Ireland. Just like a really, really interesting, tight little story. Not a single word is misplaced. Um, so I'd highly recommend Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan. Hmm. And Tracy Wu Fastenberg, what have you got? So I'm going to recommend a book that is not short and tight. Um, you know, like many people, we've been watching House of Dragon here. And I had kind of held off reading Fire and Blood because I was just mad that, you know, the actual series had not finished. We had gone backwards, you know, but I finally actually sucked it up and started reading it and really am enjoying it. I'm almost at the end. Reads differently than the other books, um, more like a history book with a little tongue in cheek in there. Um, but it was a much faster read than I, I expected. And um it's just, it's a good time. All right. Um, and then also with Halloween coming up, just, you know, endorsing, remembering that all kids are coming from a different place. You're going to have older kids that are coming. You're going to have kids that, you know, take a long time to choose their treat or, you know, are a little nervous to actually say trick or treat. And so just having patience with, with all the kids that come around, I have to remind myself that of every year, um, even having two children, but um, just remembering that every kid's coming from a different place and they're all out to just have some fun. All right. Great endorsements. I would co-endorse Children, Children of Men. It's a pretty amazing movie. But, um, and it's by Quaron. Um, all right. So I don't usually do stuff like this, but, um, but I feel like we should at least mention it on the air. We've made a big fuss about it, about it on social media. So this week, an episode of Here's the Thing, which is Alec Baldwin's podcast, dropped it. He always interviews somebody. He usually interviews somebody really famous. This time he interviewed like the least famous person he has ever interviewed on Here's the Thing. That would be me. Uh, oh, cool. So um, if you want to hear that, just you know, find Here's the Thing in any podcast feed and you'll hear about 38, 40 minutes of Alec Baldwin and I chopping it up, as the kids say. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and um, I would also recommend, and I think you could just watch season four and not even really have to worry about it. I'm I've watched most of the seasons, if not all of them. The Sinner, which is also really hot on Netflix right now. And if you like Bill Pullman and sort of late, this we're sort of late career Bill Pullman. You know, he he's kind of turned into this kind of fragile guy. He's not the pres president who goes up in a plane and fights the aliens anymore. He's uh, and he plays this guy named Harry Ambrose, who's now a retired police detective who. Of course, like all retired police detectives in fiction, is constantly running into all kinds of horrific kind of cultish style murders. I think season four is especially good. It's done in a kind of a main fishing village. Looks like maybe Vinyl Haven or Monhegan Island or something. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's harmless detective fun. Uh, but it's also genuinely creepy. And then one last instance of harmless detective fun. I'm also reading right now, and I, I'm far enough into it that I think I can endorse it, uh, uh, by the uh, Irish fiction writer. Dervla McTiernan, uh, a novel called The Scholar, set in the town of Galway, makes you yearn for the Irish West and all that rain and stuff like that. Uh, all right. So those are our endorsements. What a great panel. What a great conversation. Uh, thanks so much to Tracy Wu Fastenberg and Jacques Lamar, Rebecca Castellani. Thanks to you for listening. Jerry Lee Lewis, unfortunately, has died. And so we are going to end with a little bit of his music. Now let's get real low one time. Shit, baby, shit. All you gotta do, honey, is kind of stand in one spot. Wiggle around just a little bit. And that's what you got. Yeah. Now let's go one time.